Thank you for being here today. We have Kevin Trawartha and Hong Yu An from uh, the ICC presenting uh, on their research. So how, how we've been running these um, is allowing each of the presenters to go through their presentation. If there's short questions as, as you go along, that's fine. I'll try to monitor the chat as we're going on. But we wanna kind of save the long discussion questions for the end, because it, it's possible that you know, the questions could be answered by both presenters. So you know, we'll keep more of a, uh, you know, like a, a town hall forum at, at the end. So without further ado, Dr. Trawatha, thank you. All right. Thank you, Tim, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, so my name is Kevin Trawatha. I'm associate professor in cognitive learning sciences. Um, and I have a joint appointment in kinesiology and integrated physiology as well. So I got that mouthful out. Um, so I, I want to thank the ICC for inviting me to, to talk about my research today. I think I, I expect that probably the things that I'm going to talk about are a little unique in the, the computing world in some ways. Um, but I, I think that uh, the combination of Hung Yu's presentation and mine, you'll see that they sort of dovetail together a little bit and you can start to think more broadly about what's the relationship between computing and neuroscience and neurophysiology. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about age differences in motor behavior and what we can learn from uh, neurophysiological evidence. And to introduce the, the general research program that I have, I'd like to introduce somebody. So uh, well, I'll give you some examples of successful aging or what we might call successful aging. So this individual here is Geraldine Talley. Uh, that's not a typo. She was born in 1899 and she just died a few years ago in 2015. So she was 116 years old when she died. Uh, the pride of Michigan, she lived in Michigan. Um, what's remarkable about Geraldine it's not her chronological age in particular, but the level of functional independence that she enjoyed right into her, the final years of her life. Um, she was uh, able to get around pretty easily and even up until um, the year she died, she lived at home. Uh, now she had some help because she lived with her daughter, but you can imagine that her daughter was in her late eighties or early nineties at the time. So, you know, she had an elderly daughter helping her out, uh, but she enjoyed all kinds of motor activities that that um, demonstrated her functional independence. She liked to go for walks. She liked to sew and quilt. Um, she was an avid bowler until she was 104 years old when she finally decided to quit. And um, it wasn't just motor function that she maintained throughout her lifespan, but also cognitive function. So her friends and, and family describe her as wise and witty. And uh, one of my favorite facts was that she went on annual fishing trips with her family and in 2013, at the age of 112, she single-handedly caught seven catfish, which I always say is seven more catfish than I caught that year. So, um, so I mean, this is just an interesting example of successful aging. What we're interested in in my lab is what's the relationship between these sort of um, preserved cognitive function and preserved motor function in aging? Or a better way to put it from our perspective, what's the relationship between cognitive aging declines of cognitive aging and motor behavior. Now I have one more example, just because it's sort of apropos for the times, which is uh, this individual, this is sister Andre. Uh, she is a nun that lives in France, currently living in France. She was born in 1904. That means she's currently 118 years old. She's the second oldest known living person in the world currently. And what's really interesting is that she survived the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and currently has still survived COVID. And in fact, just before her 117th birthday, she contracted COVID and she survived that infection. Um, so my interest is in trying to understand something about this relationship between cognitive function and motor function and understand something about the brain basis of that relationship. And if we can understand that, maybe we can find ways to ensure that we, we all enjoy that kind of level of functional independence into our late life. Uh, and, and I want to convince you that that's not a holy grail, but we can actually uh, sort of chip away at those questions. So my research program is interested in, in cognitive declines in aging and the impact on motor performance. And the first thing that I always like to do is, especially on a, a wintry spring day, is to give you more bad news. Uh, how many in the room and at home are 20 years or older? All right, I have bad news. Right. So you can appreciate from this figure, this is a figure, uh, Denise Parker colleagues, uh, this has been replicated many times, of course, but it just demonstrates 
the steady decline in a variety of cognitive processes as we get older. And this is just natural, normal, healthy aging. This isn't dementia. This is just uh, the way most of us will experience our, our later years. Uh, and that decline tends to happen or start happening at, at the age of 20. So you hit your sort of peak of cognitive function at 20 years old, and you're on a steady downhill climb after that. Right? Uh, so uh, a fun story for today. Um, so we're interested in what's the impact of those cognitive changes on motor function. So in my lab, what we do is we study uh, the relationships between sensory and cognitive and motor function using this robotic device. Uh, it allows us to manipulate the sensory environments, the cognitive uh, demands of the tasks, and the, the motor environment in which people are making reaching movements. Uh, this person is holding this uh, handle. I guess I can potentially use my cursor here. So they're holding this handle, making reaching movements. And looking down at a screen, we can display virtual targets in sort of a 2D virtual reality type of system. And um, then we can try to understand something about this relationship between cognitive and motor function in particular. But we also collect neurophysiological recordings, in particular electroencephalography recordings, while people are performing cognitive motor tasks using this device. Uh, in order to try to understand something about the neurophysiology of changes in, in aging. So why, why should we think that cognitive processes are important for motor function? Well, it, it's sort of part of our common vernacular. Everyone's heard the phrase, we never forget how to ride a bicycle. Now, I don't know if that's true, but implicit and inferred, we can infer from that statement that there's some kind of cognitive mechanism, memory processes that underline the ability to retain that skill over time and to be able to perform it uh, as we get older. Um, and it turns out that a number of theories have suggested that there's an increasing interdependence between cognitive and motor function as we get older. And so even simple motor tasks, which we think of as motor tasks and not cognitive tasks, are impacted by changes in cognitive function, including walking or throwing. Um, and then you can imagine much more complex motor tasks requiring a higher level of cognitive ability. Right? Um, so we're interested just broadly in this relationship. And in particular, I'm just gonna talk about one project today for the sake of time. And it's a project looking at how we learn motor skills and how that changes as we get older. And in this particular um, experiment that I'm gonna talk about is, is all about uh, the neurophysiology of that motor learning. So how do we study motor learning in the laboratory? Uh, there are a couple of sort of gold standard tasks that are used and it's often implemented on this kind of of device that, that I talked about that I have in my lab. Um, one of them is called a force field adaptation paradigm. Here, participants are making reaching movements with the handle towards these virtual targets. And unbeknownst to them, we all of a sudden apply forces to the handle, pushing their hand in a direction perpendicular to the direction of motion in, as they're reaching towards the target. So as they're moving, they get pushed. And they have to learn to push in the opposite direction in order to counteract what the robot's doing in order to reach the target in a straight line. Um, related to that, and the one that I'm going to talk about today is a visual motor rotation paradigm. Here, it's a similar principle, but there's no uh, forces applied by the robot. But instead, people are manipulating moving a cursor around the screen. And normally, that cursor just goes wherever your hand is going. And then all of a sudden we turn on a rotation so that as I reach my hand towards the target, the cursor goes off 45 degrees in a different direction. And I have to learn by trial and error, how do I adjust my movements so that I aim 45 degrees in the opposite direction so that the cursor goes straight towards the target, right? Now that takes time. We don't tell them anything about it. They just learn it, as I said, by trial and error. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, this is just a short video. This is a, a real healthy young adults performing the task. Um, this is an avatar. So the, the participant can't actually see their hands just for demonstra demonstration purposes. All they can see are the targets on the screen and the cursor, the small white circle that you'll see. Um, what we'll start with is just some initial trials where there's no rotation applied. So you'll see that where they uh, reach their hand towards the target, the cursor goes in the same place. Hopefully this works. Good. All right, so a target appears, they make a reaching movement, and then they go on to the next trial. A new target appears, a reaching movement, in a reasonably straight line to start with. Okay, 
And now we've turned on the rotation. So they don't know it's coming and all of a sudden they have to deal with it. These are the first initial trials of experiencing the rotation. Now watch where the hand goes. The hand goes to the target, but the cursor goes in a different direction, right? rotated by 45 degrees. So initially this is hard. You don't know how to control the cursor. You make a bunch of movement corrections in order to guide the cursor towards the target. Now let's imagine they've done this for a while and now they're in late adaptation. They've uh, been learning how to do this. Now watch where their movements go. Their hand moves not towards the target, but off 45 degrees in the opposite direction. Now it's not perfect yet, but they're getting better. And the cursor is more or less getting back to going to a straight line towards the target. So this paradigm has been used uh, quite a lot over the last few decades of, uh, as a way of providing a novel motor task that people have to learn and learn by trial and error. So we can really start to understand how do we acquire a new motor skill that we've never performed before. Oh. All right. So current theory suggests that there are multiple memory systems that underlie the ability to do this type of, of motor skill learning. Uh, during that initial phase where you're first experiencing the rotation and you have to initially learn what it is that you need to do to control the cursor, uh, performance has been correlated with working memory performance. So it seems that working memory seems to be important during that initial phase of learning. Uh, later learning seems to be associated more with procedural memory, where I'm starting to refine the skill and perfect that skill, uh, where working memory is less important, procedural memory becomes important. And then, then if I learn the skill and then I have to come back and perform it again on another day, let's say, I need to rely on long-term retention using episodic memory to remember what the skill was that I learned in, in, in order to produce it again. So here's a figure just representing my current sort of theoretical um, framework of what I think people are doing in these types of tasks. During that initial acquisition of trying to learn this type of motor skill, that early learning is driven largely by working memory. As I learn the skill, I transition to relying more on procedural memory to perfect the skill. And then if I had some delay and I had to remember and come back and do it again the next day, I would rely on episodic memory to retrieve information about how to do the skill again. So we're interested then in, well, what's the impact of age-related declines in these memory processes? As, you, as I showed you before, a variety of cognitive processes, including both long-term and importantly for, for our purposes today, working memory declines as we get older. And it turns out if you ask people to do this visual motor adaptation task, older adults um, to do this task, they have difficulty learning the task. And they, they do particularly poorly during early learning, someone suggested. And we've shown previously that declines in the ability to learn this type of motor task is correlated with working memory performance. Now, of course, as we know, correlation is not causation. So we recently did another study where we did an experimental manipulation of the working memory demands during the task. And if you can reduce the working memory demands of the task, older adults actually do pretty well. And the age differences that we typically observe tend to go away, especially in early learning. Now, uh, I know that, the, that cognitive psychology isn't the main field for a lot of the folks in the ICC, but uh, for those of you who are aware of, of working memory, um, like us, you might start to question, well, what, what aspects of working memory? It's actually a pretty complex construct. And this is um, Alan Badley's most updated, as far as I know, a model of working memory, um, showing that there's a lot of different components to working memory, um, including what we would call a visual spatial sketch pad. So our ability to remember or um, uh, bring into our immediate conscious awareness visual spatial relationships about the world. So that's the kind of thing that seems appropriate and the, the kinds of processes that would be involved in learning this kind of motor skill because it's a highly spatial, visual spatial task. Um, but in addition to that, we started thinking about it and it, it seems what you're really doing is learning to update your movements by reflecting on the errors that you made on the previous trial. Okay. And so maybe what you're really doing is updating working memory about what the errors are that you make in a given trial and using that to update motor commands on the next trial so that you can try to reduce the error. And then you continually do that as you're learning the task. So then our, our assumption is a related process called working memory updating, which is an executive control process. Maybe that's what underlies motor learning. 
And maybe it's age-related changes in working memory updating that explain age differences in motor learning and visual motor rotation. So here's where we turn to some, a, a neurophysiological approach to try to, to get at that question. Um, and it's because there's a, sort of a long history in electroencephalography recordings uh, with event-related designs showing that if you, if you do a, um, a variety of different types of cognitive tasks that rely on working memory updating, you can elicit what's called a P3B or P300 that's at a posterior site, the back of the, the scalp, um, as you can see over here, um, that is associated with working memory updating. And importantly, that P3B component, ERP component is also attenuated in aging. So it's impacted by the aging process. Recently, another group did um, a visual motor rotation paradigm while recording EEG. And they showed that uh, you can elicit that P3B component. And interestingly, the P3B is reduced systematically throughout learning. So as you learn, going from late learning to mid learning to, uh, from early learning, sorry, to mid learning to late learning. And I'll just orient you here that by convention, some people in the EEG world flip everything so that a positive is down and negative is up. I don't follow that same convention. I like, like in the top one, I put positive in the up direction and negative in the down direction, uh, but it's the same thing, just flipped on its axis. Um, so we became interested in, well, if, if this is a, a physiological marker of, or, or a physiological response that is consistent with working memory updating, uh, is, can we elicit that in young adult and older adults? And is it different between the age groups in a visual motor rotation task? So we recruited 25 young and older adults. We used a 32 channel EEG system and we asked that question. And we use that same visual motor rotation paradigm that I described to you earlier. Um, here, this shows you just a, this sort of um, trial structure of how people go through this experiment. They start with a number of trials where there's no rotation. They just get used to making the reaching movements to the target. The cursor goes where their hand is going. Then we apply the 45 degree rotation for 160 trials. And by trial and error, they learn how to adapt, or at least they start to learn how to adapt. And then we have another um, 40 trials where we take the rotation away and we can assess after effects of how long do they maintain that adapted movement over time. And what we're primarily going to focus on is just this adaptation phase of how do they learn during the when the rotation is turned on. So to assess performance, the, the primary dependent measure that we use of performance is an angular error. So that's just looking at what's the angle of the path of the cursor relative to the angle of, or, or a straight line connecting the start position to the target, right? If they were aiming perfectly at the target, the angle would be zero. Anything away from that is some type of error. And it's gonna be a systematic error in the direction of the rotation initially. So um, these are behavioral results from that study. This just shows the angular error and it's just signed so that clockwise is, is um, positive and counterclockwise is negative. They start off with a minus 45 degree rotation. Both younger and older adults improve performance over time. The angular error gets smaller and smaller, closer and closer to zero. But the older adults show a sort of systematic difference in how well they adapt to the visual motor rotation than young adults, um, which in our case, in this sample, turned out to be true both in early and late learning. So then we turn to the um, EEG data, and we extracted event-related components to each one of the target appearance. So the target appears, and then we look at the electrical activity across the scalp. And we identified that there was this P3B component. So it was a P300 that was maximal at PZ, which is at the back of the head, and consistent with a, a typical P3B component. And both groups exhibited that, but the young adults showed this systematic uh, attenuation of that P3B across learning from the first through the fourth quarter of adaptation, right? Exactly replicating the finding from that previous group. Uh, but older adults don't show that same thing. And in fact, it's a lot more sort of messy in, in that group. So that seemed to suggest to us that we have at least some neurophysiological evidence consistent with this hypothesis that 
diminished ability to update working memory, but the errors you've made may impact your ability to learn in this type of visual motor task. So um, we know that motor learning is diminished in older adults in these types of sensory motor adaptation tasks. Um, it may or may not be early learning. Some studies have shown particular um, impairments in the, the earliest stages of learning. Some studies haven't shown that. And we've, we've seen both. We've seen it sometimes and sometimes we don't. So we don't really know exactly why. Um, but we do know that reduced performance in older adults, especially early on, is correlated with working memory performance on independent measures of working memory. And then this current study suggests some uh, neurophysiological evidence that working memory updating is diminished in older adults, and that might be an underlying factor that impacts how well they, they learn to adapt in this type of motor task. All right, and um, I'll leave it there. And I just want to acknowledge my grad students who are involved in this project or, or were involved in the project previously, and of course, the funding sources and institutes, and, and I'll uh, particularly highlight this one right here, uh, the ICC for their support. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. If, if Tim, you want to wait until after Hung Yu presents and we can do that. Yeah, if there's a quick question, that's fine, but uh, any longer discussion. Okay. Any quick questions before we move on? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Hong Yu. I'm a, an assistant professor. I uh, joined uh, Michigan Tech uh, uh, two years ago during the pandemic. And this is my first time to give the talk in person. After that, actually, I actually did my defense remotely. Okay, so today I'd like to introduce uh, my research uh, field, uh, which is the neuromorphic computing and its applications. So this is our one. Today I'm going to introduce the first uh, roughly background about uh, what neuromorphic computing is. And after that, I will introduce uh, two ongoing projects. The first project is uh, we collaborate with Dr. Yu from the biomedical uh, engineering uh, department and uh, neuromorphic closed loop deep brain simulation system for Parkinson's disease. The second uh, project is the self-learning robotics with associated memory learning. Yeah. Anyway, so first I'd like to introduce the, the brain uh, the comparison between the human brain and the digital computers. So right now we have a lot of powerful computational platforms like the personal computer, uh, GPU and the cell phones. So the main difference between the brain and the digital computer is uh, fundamentally different from the very low level, from device level to the very high level, like the learning method. So at the device level or component level, actually uh, our digital computer used the uh, uh, logic gates like transistors and uh, to perform all the binary signals like zero one. And uh, we use mainly use the Wynuma uh, architecture that basically separate the computing unions and the memory unions and connect them with a bus. Okay. And at last, then we use uh, uh, recruit a lot of coders to program uh, on the computers. Okay, but uh, for the human brain, we use a different, fundamentally different uh, components and uh, learning algorithms. Like uh, we use neurons as the processing, as the computing processing unions, and uh, the signals, the communication between neurons are the spike signal, other than the uh, zero one zero one digital signal. And uh, at the architecture level, actually, it's a distributed architecture, okay? All the com computing unions, like neurons, and all the memory unions, like the synapse, they are close to each other, okay? And forming a network, okay? At last, the learning algorithm, actually, we use a kind of uh, associated memory, learning to memorize the two events happening together, okay? So that's the uh, fundamental, uh, roughly introducing uh, introduction to the difference between the human uh, human brain and the digital computer. So the question is, uh, could we just uh, to create a more intelligent uh, machine by emulating the uh, our human brain? Could we just combine the biological neural network 
hardware design and the algorithm together forming a new concept that new model computing. It's a, basically the hardware software co-design approach of real life seeing artificial intelligence through uh, emulating the human brain. Okay, this is the uh, concept of new morphic computing. So, <coughs> sorry, it's a fundamentally different uh, approach for realizing artificial intelligence. Right now, the most hot, hottest uh, topic is uh, deep learning. But the deep learning right now uh, has several uh, drawbacks like the very large amount of data for training. Without that, the deep learning cannot update their uh, new network uh, technologies. And also they require a lot of, a lot of energy, a lot of uh, uh, energy. And uh, we also need uh, uh, manually to coding and um, label all the data sets, okay? So one way is we, we, we use the traditional uh, hardware uh, that requires a larger and larger data set and the larger and larger uh, data centers consuming more and more energy. Another part, another way is we try to learn again from our brain to design a low power consumption devices and try to use spiking signals rather than the digital signals and try to implement a kind of self-learning uh, algorithm or method that uh, not uh, depends on the big data. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the roughly introduction about uh, uh, the difference between the uh, deep learning and the new model computing. So before I go more details, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the, the structure of our human brain. So our human brain is formed by with the, the neurons and the synapse, okay, forming a biological neural network. It's very complicated, but uh, all the uh, single neurons has a uh, similar structures, like uh, they all have the diagram, okay, like the tree-like uh, structure here. Okay, this structure will receive the signal from other neurons. After that, uh, all the spiking signals here will integrate together at the soma, which is neural body, okay? Integrate all the signal together. And the, the, if the integrated signal the sum of the signal larger than a specific uh, uh, voltage, we call that threshold voltage. Then this soma will launch another spiking signal to the axon. Okay. Then the axon will propagate uh, these spiking signals uh, to other neurons through the synapse. Okay. So the neuroscience field, the people believe that the, the synapse uh, highly relate to the memory function. Right. So this uh, this uh, uh, synapse uh, uh, basically is a uh, uh, connecting organ between all the neurons. Okay, and uh, there is a very uh, simple <coughs> hypothesis that also, you can call that a uh, hanging theory. If the neurons, okay, two neurons, firing together, and the synaptic connection between these two neurons will become stronger and stronger. Okay. Uh, in our work, uh, we use this kind of algorithm or theory to train our neural network. Okay. So uh, let's first introduce the first uh, the, the the first project is uh, we try to apply new model on computing on the deep brain stimulation. Okay. So deep brain stimulation is the uh, treatment for uh, mainly for the Parkinson's disease. Okay. Basically, they will have some implant of small devices, okay, in, your, uh, in the chest. Then this uh, device will constantly send the spiking signals uh, to the patient, PD patients, okay? And these spiking signals will um, suppress the symptoms of the Parkinson's disease, okay? But this kind of uh, uh, traditional uh, DBS, okay, DBS for short for the deep brain stimulation. We call that this open loop deep brain, uh, DBS system because uh, this device implanted in the chest will constantly send the stimulus uh, signals to our to the brain, okay. 
but this uh, constant signals we call the, the sad effect, okay? And all, also it's a very low power efficiency because you constantly send the signals. It's very fast to join the, the battery implant in your chest. So our idea is, uh, is that uh, possible we can uh, build a closed loop uh, DBS system. Uh, we call that closed loop because, uh, okay, you, we will use some uh, neuromorphic uh, devices to monitor the symptom of the uh, Parkinson's disease. Okay, basically we can use, uh, for this open loop, we just uh, send signals, okay, one direction from the device to our brain. In the closed loop, uh, we also can use this device to monitor, to capture some signal and use this signal, signal to evaluate uh, right now the symptom of the Parkinson's disease, okay? Then we send back or uh, optimize the determinants to the, to the brain, okay? In this way, we can send some optimized uh, determinant signals that uh, can uh, integrate the side effect. Also, if the symptom of the Parkinson's disease is not so severe, we can actually uh, send a low frequency signals. Then we somehow uh, save the energy. Okay, that's the idea. We we call that. Oh, it's a, in the field. People call that it's the closed loop deep brain stimulation signal. Uh, system. So this is our work actually. Uh, the first thing we need some parameters to evaluate the symptom of the Parkinson's disease. Okay, so we use a specific uh, uh, range of the oscillation signal from our from the brain. So we call that uh, it's the beta oscillation signal. It's at the uh, certain of the certain frequency range. Okay, so if the, this beta uh, oscillation signals are higher. That means uh, the, the PD system are very uh, serious. And if it is lower, okay, this is no PD system. Okay, so we try to use uh, the software and hardware co-design to implement uh, a new motor system to recognize all these uh, two levels or several levels maybe. So the first uh, we build uh, uh, with the help of Dr. Yu, we build the animal, uh, model of the Parkinson's disease, we inject the neurotoxin to the mouse, okay, to kill some specific neurons, then to make this mouse pass the, the Parkinson's disease, okay, it, it, the, the mouse is sacrificed for our research. And other, uh, after that, we also inject some specific variables for the for the opogenetic method. Also, genetic method is that some neurons can, uh, with this variance, can only respond to some light of the, uh, some light. So basically, if the, the light is on, then you provide some stimulant to the signal, or to the neuron, okay? This is not a traditional uh, electrical stimulant, okay? It's, uh, it's the light. Uh, stimulus signals. Okay. So after that, we, we make this uh, mouse to uh, arrive to have the uh, Parkinson's disease. Okay. Then next step is we try to use a uh, uh, spiking neural network to recognize the different uh, uh, levels of the uh, beta oscillation. So right now we, we do not use the traditional uh, deep neural network. We try use a spiking new life for method. So here we use a, a method called a, a, a white stone method, okay? So traditional, uh, because we try to use a stratfold function as a neural, okay? But uh, the, not, the stratfold function does not have the uh, uh, derivative, so cannot uh, use a traditional back propagation method. So one stone method just during the training, it will change the traditional bounded nonlinear function gradually to the strand hole function. Okay, that's the method how we uh, train a spiking neural network. 
So this is all the parameters okay, we use. Furthermore, we try to use, uh, as I mentioned that new model computing, we try to combine a lot of things like the hardware design and the algorithm. The web phone is a kind of a uh, training algorithm. And also we use a specific uh, device called a Manister as uh, uh, implemented a synapse, okay? It's kind of emerging memory devices, similar like the SRAM. Okay, to save the, the uh, zero and one uh, data. Okay, so it's a basically a kind of resistor. Okay, and this resistor can change with the high resistance. Okay, the right spot here. And the black spot here is a low resistance. Okay, so we can recognize the high resistance as one and the low resistance as the uh, zero. Okay. The reason we use that is uh, it's very uh, the size of the memory are very small. Okay, that can it can significantly reduce the memory uh, size, design size, hardware design size, and also it has kind of low power consumption. Okay. So we have the hardware design, and we have the algorithm. How do we evaluate? So we extract all the uh, casting data and the training data from the computational model and uh, experimental uh, data together using West Zone, which is uh, the training algorithm to train the spiking network. After that, we have the weights, okay? For new network, we have all the synaptic weights. And we put these weights into a Hard uh, architecture level simulator, new thing to evaluate uh, if we really design this trip, or what's the kind of the uh, design area, the latency, and power consumptions. Okay, we use these uh, parameters to input this uh, uh, hardware simulator. Okay, after that, we have some results. So basically, if you, you, we use the uh, surviving neural network. We use the MySQL synapse, okay? The design, the trip area, uh, latency, and uh, energy will significantly reduce the compare we use the traditional SRAM as the memory, okay? That's the, the result we have. So this is the first uh, project. Uh, we try to apply the water computing onto the deep brain simulation system. Uh, so, any questions? Okay, if no questions, uh, we can go to uh, our last project. It's the uh, associated memory learning. So, associated memory learning is uh, uh, a very uh, popular learning in the animals. Okay, basically. Uh, the very classic uh, explainer is uh, performed by the uh, Bakhnov uh, study on the dog. Okay, the dog actually can memorize the, the sound of the bell and uh, as the food. Okay, if you provide the, the bell, the sound of the bell and food together, okay, the, the dog will memorize the, the sound of the food. Okay, and actually, human us also uh, try to use this uh, learning to memorize the letter and the, the object, okay, together. So here is a, a very classic uh, uh, experiment about the, to evaluate the associated memory learning. So there is a rat here, okay? Initially, if you get some, you provide some shock, okay, you like the shock here, the, the rat will, will run away or, or provide some fear response like a freezing, okay? And if you only provide the sound here, well, nothing happened because the, 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 rat, the sound will not hurt the, the rats, okay? So a social memory learning just to make the, the, the rat to, re, to memorize the sound and the shock together. So we provide the, the, the sound and shock simultaneously together. Then after that, we repeat, uh, people repeat several times. Then 
the sound, if you only provide the sound to the rat, the rat also will run away. Okay. So once that actually there are uh, several uh, rationale between uh, analyzing this uh, this behavior. So basically, in our brain, in the brain, well, right now it's in the rat's brain. So different signals are processed at different regions using different neural networks. Okay. So like uh, this part neural network specific only process the sound, and this part neural network only process the shock. Okay. And they have different signal pathway. Okay. After they pre-process all the signals, all the uh, output signals here will converge together and process at a, another neural network. And then this neural network will have some output. And this is the response neural network that provides some running away behavior of the mouse. So from here, we can say that uh, there's a two signal pathways. Okay, in the uh, uh, associated memory learning, we call that a shock. This signal pathway is unconditional signal pathway. Why? Because uh, it's unconditionally will invoke the, the, the fear response. Okay, and the sound signal is the uh, conditional signal pathway. Initially, well, the, the rat, this signal pathway is blocked, cannot propagate in the the sound signal to invoke a uh, response of fear response. Okay, so this signal pathway is conditional, and the, the, the signal pathway from the shock is unconditional. Okay, so this is uh, two different uh, signal pathways in the associated memory. And uh, if we provide the shock and sound simultaneously, what happens? to make this uh, initially block signal pathway become through, okay? This is uh, something interesting. And um, people do some work, okay? So Dr. Shadow, uh, he uh, found a specific uh, animal called the sea slug, okay? And he found uh, two specific uh, signal pathway from the siphon to the, uh, to the, the, the gill here, and uh, from the tail to the gill as well. So there is a two signal pathway for this very simple animal. So <clears throat> the, from the tail to the gill, this is unconditional stimulus signal pathway. So if you touch the tail, the grill will shrink, okay? Unconditionally. But initially, if you cut the siphon here, Okay, here is the siphon. If you cut, well, the, the shrimp, the grill will not shrink. Okay, that means that this, uh, un, this conditional signal pathway does not go through, okay, initially. So he cut, then he cut the siphon and cut the tail simultaneously. So we can see here, actually, these two signal stimulus overlap, or overlap together and for several times. Then the received signal as a, the gill motor initially is small. After several times, it uh, becomes larger. That means uh, this is the sensor neuron, the sensor neuron as a response neuron, okay? If this response neuron fires, okay, basically they will stimulate a, a wheel to strap. So that means if we provide the conditional stimulus and unconditional stimulus simultaneously, the synthetic weight will become stronger, okay? So this is uh, what happened if we, uh, we provide the conditional and unconditional uh, stimulus together. So we try to rebuild this similar response. And we replace the Unconditional stimulus uh, with the electrical shock here and the conditional sound here with the vibration platform and the light. So uh, the vibration platform serve as the unconditional stimulus and the light serve as the conditional uh, stimulus. 
okay? And the response is moving away from this vibration, uh, vibration handful, okay? And we replace the, the rat with, a, with a, a mobile robot. Okay, so we, we did the simulation. Just here, if we provide the distance from the lab input only at the low firing here, so the robot will not move. But if we provide them together, okay, we can see here the, the, the response neural fire, okay? So after several training cycles, uh, if we stop providing the variation, a variation signals only provide the light here, you know, the so response neural will fire, okay? So this is the, the simulation. We implement several neurons with the integrated fire model. And we try to update the synaptic rate with the having learning, okay? And also the last, the last step is to try to have some uh, experimental radiation. So first we provide the light here, okay? Uh, maybe, okay. So I light here and the robot does not move. And uh, next uh, we pro uh, provide uh, the vibration handphone. Then the, the robot move away from this platform when he sends the, the vibration. The next step is we, we reset to the, 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 the robot to the same, uh, Location, then we provide the light and the vibration, the light long and the vibration together, okay, for the tra training process. Right now, the students uh, was uh, trying to turn on this vibration, but it's not, uh, well, the, the remote is not very good. Okay, probably right now it's on. No, it's on right now. So right now we provide the light and the vibration together, okay? The robot sends the vibration, then it go back, okay? So the next step is we also reset again, the robot to the same uh, location. And this time we do not provide the vibration. We only provide the light. Then the robot will move away. So through this kind of uh, learning, this kind of online learning and real-time learning, okay? So the robot will reproduce the, the, the social memory learning similar to the rat, okay? So this is the simulation and the, the experimental design. So, so that's all for right now, or we are working on this two project. Okay, new motor computing as you, no, I, as I introduced, uh, they combine a lot of things, okay? We try to implement a uh, low power consumption and self-learning system, okay? So right now, we are working on the self-learning using a robot, okay? That's where we try to implement a uh, hardware and software design, co-design for, uh, for the medical application, okay? So that's, uh, that's uh, what we are going do right now. So this is a reference and uh, I want to thank uh, my students, Zach and uh, Noah, and also my collaborator, Dr. Yu, she's Yu, and also uh, thank the, the Michigan Tech and the ICC. Okay. Thank you very much. We have time for uh, some questions, um, and then I'm sure that uh, Tom will do it. And then probably go to the chat for further um, questions. But I, I guess I'll, I'll kick it off and say, you know, I think it's really interesting to, to see two research directions together um, because there's certainly, a, it, it, it's like you're attacking the same problem from very different ways. And so, I mean, you do see now that each other's presentations, ways in which you know you, you might inform your own directions in the future or or not. That's a big no. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, it's it's intriguing to me the I think that there are ways that the that the modeling approach and being able to do simulations of behavior might allow us to do much faster iterations many times to, to test out hypotheses that is harder for us to test with humans, right? Um, the thing that I think is, is curious to me is, the, is how to build in more, uh, you know, build in variance into your system. And I don't know if that, that you do because I don't know his field very well, but, but the, you know, humans are messy, right? And so um, trying to, um, you know, uh, we, we get a lot of, of error variance that, that gets built into our systems and it makes it difficult to, to assess uh, the, the differences between groups and so on. But and I'm curious if your approach on you had, if you build in noise into the system as well. And so, so you've got like the, <laughs> this is best case scenario rather than-, um, than You can also use uh, Right now we use the real data from the vibration and mm -hmm. the, the light signal. So already has a lot of noise there. So we do not uh, deal with that. Uh, I, I suppose you, you mentioned the noise. Is the noise in the brain? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's noise in responses. It's noise in the sensory system for humans. Uh, there's noise at every level of the system, basically. If given. OK, yeah. The, the noise, um, we can provide some noise right now. So right now, the, the Actually, we, we can see there's a light here. So later, I will try to implement a, a more complicated vision uh, recognition system, like uh, uh, the, the digital recognition with the, the MIST, maybe. So in that level, I will uh, definitely will provide a lot of noise. OK. So, but right now, it's uh, relatively simple. So the, the first step is to implement, to make this system run the next level is a natural approach is to provide more variables and more noise. It seems to me that I follow you, you're, you're developing a, an electronic model of, of the brain. Yeah. You know, you're using what we know to be allowed to do on the brain and then applying that to the brain thinking system. Um, then yeah. you're trying to understand that. So it almost seems like how do you your simplifying systems in the brain to try to train them to produce the data that we haven't seen the human variables to maybe get a glimpse of you know the inner workings of what's happening. Rather than training a system to be optimal, training it to be human. Jeff? That's possible, but we need a lot of lot of computational resources to do that because the brain is so large. And another thing is that the reason why I try to add the the, the mouse level that's maybe a, a little easier to. And um, yeah, and uh, as I know that EGG is uh, has a lot of noise, right? It's uh, it's very hard to capture all the Neural firings. Neural mapping is also very hard challenge, hard task. Yeah. How to how to get all the the the, the, the firing signals of our brain. Yeah. It's possible, but uh, it's very hard. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was getting at, right? Is that in in a in an artificial system like this, you can you don't have to build in. You know, for humans, there's noise in the sensory system. So the sensory signals I get are not always detected in the same way. There's noise in the motor output of the system. So it's not going to be the, a perfect representation. There's noise in my memory of what, because it's not a perfect memory. And so what I learned from moment to moment, you know, we get these, you know, learning or, or performance curves that improve over time, but they actually go up and down all over the place because people don't learn in a linear fashion, right? And, um, um, and, and then there's noise in, in just the neural output as well. So there, there's sort of multiple layers of noise across the entire system, which is what I was trying to get at uh, in my initial response. And so it's interesting because you have an approach where you can just bypass a lot of that noise and get a more um, think, a cleaner representation. I, I think my, my focus right now is more low level to the neural level and a small, a small group of neural groups. Yeah, yeah. It's not like behavior level. It's, 